today I will be speaking with you about uh, COVID-19 tests. And as you all know, we are looking for the perfect COVID-19 test. Um, so I've divided my talk into the following sections. First, I will talk about why diagnostics for COVID-19 are important. Um, then I will give an overview of COVID-19 diagnostics, those that are detecting um, the SARS coronavirus type 2 virus um, and uh, diagnostics that detect antibodies against the virus. Um, I will then um, say a little bit about the challenges of determining diagnostic accuracy of these tests. Um, then I will discuss how COVID-19 testing has been used thus far in the Netherlands to fight the epidemic. Um, and I will close with a discussion of potential roles of testing in containing the epidemic in the future. So why is it important to test for the virus? Um, I, I understood from Joyce that uh, uh, you have already um, studied the Harvard Medical Students uh, COVID-19 website. This figure, I, I took this figure from that website. And there is a lot of uh, very good information there on basic virology um, and immunology. And what you see in this figure is from the time of infection, uh, people usually do not become ill immediately. There is an incubation period in which they carry the virus, but they don't yet have any symptoms. Um, then they develop symptoms, and this is what we call the disease period. Um, um, and then eventually the symptoms resolve. Um, and typically for viral infections, uh, people uh, can shed virus. There are different possibilities. Uh, sometimes shedding is only taking place uh, during uh, symptoms, so when people are actually diseased. Uh, but often people will also shed virus before they develop symptoms and even after they resolve symptoms and in some cases even when they never develop symptoms at all. Um, so these are called when people don't develop any symptoms, I will refer to that as asymptomatic uh, shedding or transmission um, and then there is the pre-symptomatic, symptomatic and post-symptomatic. Um, as you all know, I think, Probably the symptoms of uh, COVID-19 are what we call flu-like. So they are quite general symptoms. Um, and these are the types of symptoms that can be caused by many different pathogens. So for example, most of the common cold viruses cause these symptoms and also influenza. Um, so to make a COVID-19 uh, diagnosis, um, it, this is usually because the, the tests that we currently have are not perfect, which I will uh, discuss later. Um, so the diagnosis is usually based on multiple factors. Um, a physician, when they try to make a diagnosis, they will take symptoms that the patient reports into account, as well as clinical signs uh, that they might uh, assess during a physical examination. Um, then, of course, they will use the tests that we currently have. Um, they will also use uh, more general tests that indicate whether someone has an infection or inflammation going on, such as CRP. Uh, patients who are hospitalized, uh, they will, uh, most of them will have a lung CT scan. Um, and the, um, the CT scans are quite typical for COVID-19. So this is often used to make a diagnosis. Um, and they may also have uh, lots of laboratory tests that indicate uh, organ dysfunction or damage. So this is more a measure of how seriously ill someone is. And then, of course, um, we will also take a history of the patient. So we will know whether they have been exposed to someone who has already been diagnosed with COVID-19 or whether they perhaps transmitted the virus. So when, for example, in a household, when we see several cases of COVID-19, even when someone tests negative, we would still assume that they do have COVID-19 because their housemates have COVID-19. Um, so symptoms, uh, if, we, if we could diagnose patients based on symptoms alone, that would be by far the easiest. Um, but unfortunately, uh, that is not sufficient. Uh, most of the, the specific COVID-19 symptoms, um, so for example, shortness of breath, which we do not usually see with influenza or common colds, so that one is quite specific for COVID-19, but it only occurs when patients um, already have moderate or severe disease. Um, most patients, more than 80% is the current estimate, um, are only mild cases. 
Uh, so they, they may not have shortness of breath and they have very a, a specific symptoms. So you wouldn't really know whether it's COVID-19 or a common cold or maybe even an allergy. Um, and particularly in the winter time, um, you know, as, as you know, many respiratory pathogens are circulating. So it would be really difficult to differentiate COVID-19 from these other respiratory pathogens. And then in other times of the year, when we have high pollen levels, for example, a lot of people have allergies. Um, and those are also similar to the symptoms of COVID-19. Um, another reason why symptoms uh, alone are not sufficient for diagnosing uh, COVID-19 is that the current estimate um, is that pre-symptomatic uh, transmission of the virus uh, may um, account for 30 to 50 percent of all transmissions. Um, so it's definitely not just the symptomatic people who are passing the virus on to other people, but this can occur before symptoms develop. Um, as we discussed in the previous slides, um, sometimes there might also be transmission um, post um, symptoms or um, when someone never develops symptoms at all. But the current thinking is that this is not very common in COVID-19. In COVID-19, most of the transmission is thought to take place before symptoms develop and when symptoms are present. But because it's also before symptoms are present, you know, it would be important to try to make a diagnosis before uh, the symptoms are present. Are there any questions so far? Okay, so then I will move on to an overview of the different COVID-19 diagnostics that are currently available or that are being developed. Before I do that, I wasn't sure if everyone um, who is joining us tonight has a biomedical background. So just in case, um, I decided uh, on this slide to show you what the, the diagnostic tests actually look for. Um, so there are, broadly speaking, there are three different types of tests. Um, there are tests that look for uh, uh, viral proteins. These are, we refer to them, um, in medicine, we refer to them as antigens. Um, so these are typically the proteins that are on the surface of the virus. Um, and these antigens are recognized by the immune system, and the immune system then makes antibodies. So we also, um, there is also a category of diagnostic tests that detects antibodies in blood. Um, and then another um, a category of tests um, detects the viral RNA. This is the genetic code of the virus. Um, and in, K in, in humans, this is DNA, but this virus, the genetic code is RNA. So some of the tests actually detect the viral RNA. So I will actually start with uh, describing the assays that detect uh, the viral RNA. Uh, these tests are the ones that are currently um, uh, used uh, most often. Um, and most of these tests are what we call reverse transcriptase PCR. Um, um, they, they're called reverse transcriptase because in normal PCR you detect DNA. And in this case, the RNA of the virus first has to be transcribed into DNA. Um, and then uh, different types of primers are used. On, this, on the bottom of this slide, you see the genetic code of the virus and which uh, parts of the code, um, uh, code for the different types of proteins that the virus uses. Um, and uh, the tests are directed towards the, the genes for these different proteins. So some of them are directed uh, towards the RNA polymerase, uh, some to the envelope protein gene, uh, the nucleocapsid gene, the spike protein gene. Those are the most common ones. When you do PCR, there are two different ways of doing it. Uh, one is by using a thermocycler. Basically, what that means is that the temperature of the chemical reaction uh, constantly changes. So the uh, the reagents are heated up and then cooled down and heated up again. So this is what's called a thermocycler and that this is what most of the conventional platforms um, uh, do. Uh, but more recently, um, um, some companies have figured out a way to do PCR 
um, at the same constant temperature. So this is called isothermal. Um, and this is uh, the method that most of the point of care tests use. Um, and I will uh, uh, get to that a bit in, in the next slides. Some of the things that are really important when you're detecting viral RNA, basically um, the, the viral RNA is only present when the virus itself is present. And as we saw on the first slide, uh, the virus uh, enters the body at the time of infection, uh, then stays in the body for a few weeks, uh, typically two to three weeks, and then uh, it leaves the body and symptoms resolve. So the virus is only there for a short period of time, typically two to three weeks. Um, so, of course, when you do a test, you can only take the specimen that you use for the testing during that time period when the virus is present. Um, the virus binds uh, to receptors uh, that are present mostly in the respiratory tract, uh, but also in the gastrointestinal tract. Um, so, the most commonly used specimens are nasopharyngeal swaps, so nose throat swaps. Uh, but sometimes also oropharyngeal, mouth throat swaps. You can also use saliva, sputum, or feces. Um, but by far the most common, and this is what you've also seen on television, is the nasopharyngeal swaps. Um, and it actually has turned out to be quite challenging to collect sufficient material because uh, for this test to work well, you have to have um, enough cells in your sample that contain the virus. Um, and it's actually not easy um, to collect uh, sufficient um, uh, specimens. Uh, but when you do manage to collect a, a good specimen, then these tests work really well. They're very sensitive and they're also highly specific uh, because they are based on the genetic code. Each virus has their own genetic code, so there is no cross-reactivity with other coronaviruses, for example, if you choose the primers well. So it should be possible to have tests that are both very uh, specific and also very sensitive. So on this slide, I've listed some of the RT-PCR tests that are currently um, available. There is one uh, non-commercial test that was developed by the RIVM in the Netherlands uh, together with Erasmus Universi University. Um, and then there are also many commercial tests available. Um, for example, the test uh, that was developed by Roche uh, for the Roche Cobas platform. And on the picture, you show, um, I am, I'm showing you an example of one of the several Cobas platforms that are available. Um, and uh, uh, Roche has the largest market share in the Netherlands. This was one of the problems in the beginning of the epidemic because there weren't enough reagents, because everyone was using the same test. Um, but there actually are many other tests available on the market. But of course, the laboratory can only use the tests for which they have the machines. Um, so these tests typically require large thermocycling machines. Um, so these are only available in central laboratories. Um, when, you, when you run a test, it takes a few hours. Um, and you also uh, typically have to test many samples at the same time. And this can be an advantage because it's typically a bit cheaper and you get the results for many tests uh, within a few hours. Uh, but it can also be a disadvantage because sometimes you want to test the patient quickly and then you have to wait for the, for the run to fill up. So it's not always an advantage. So then um, other um, RT-PCR tests are the so-called point of care tests. Um, so these are tests that, that are decentralized. Um, they typically, they still require machines, um, but these are very small machines that are portable. Um, so I've shown uh, two examples on this slide. For example, the Cephate uh, uh, Gene Expert platform is, is quite well known. It's, for example, used worldwide to test for tuberculosis. Um, then Abbott has a new machine on the market, which is called the ID Now. Uh, the, a company called BioFire, which is a subsidiary of uh, uh, BioMilieu, uh, they also have uh, a, 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 a similar platform like this one called the Film Array, and there are a few others. And these types of uh, point of care tests, they 
sometimes they just test for the presence of the SARS coronavirus 2, uh, but sometimes they, um, they, also, they test for multiple uh, respiratory pathogens at the same time. So this is what they call a respiratory panel. So they will have the SARS virus on the, the panel, but also, um, for example, the, the coronaviruses that cause common colds, uh, the influenza virus, adenoviruses, etc. So then when someone comes in with flu-like symptoms, you can basically just do one test and you get a result for all of the pathogens that may have caused the symptoms. Um, so as I uh, mentioned, these can be done on portable isothermal machines. They typically only require 30 to 60 minutes um, to give results. Um, and you typically, you can do either one sample or um, a few samples, uh, typically up to about 10 samples at a time. Um, so they can be decentralized, but they are too complex for, uh, you know, people to do themselves. You still require uh, uh, people who have been trained to do the test. Um, but you can train, for example, you might be able to train a, a general practitioner to do the test. It doesn't have to be done um, by highly skilled uh, lab technicians. Another disadvantage of this, uh, these types of tests is that they, they are not really cheaper than the conventional tests. They're still quite expensive. Another type of test that, uh, that you could use to, to detect uh, the virus itself uh, are tests that are um, uh, detecting the antigens. So these are the viral proteins. Um, a lot of what I just told you applies to these tests as well. You, you have to do the test while someone is infected with the virus, so you can only do it for about two to three weeks. Um, um, and the, the tests use similar detection techniques as antibody tests, so I will explain how this works in the next slide. So this is very different from the, the PCR tests. Um, but the, these tests basically uh, make use of the fact that antibodies recognize antigens and bind to the antigens. So you can use those types of tests to either detect antigens or to detect antibodies. Um, these tests are, are generally less sensitive than PCR, um, but they can be made point of care much more easily, which I will also discuss when I discuss the antibody tests. Um, at the moment, uh, some of these tests are under development, uh, but none of them are available um, yet. So in general, um, when you want to detect the virus itself, uh, what are some of the challenges? I've already mentioned that you only have a short window in which the sample has to be taken. Um, the virus uh, infects specific cells, so you have to make sure that when you collect the specimen that those cells are in your specimen, and this can be quite challenging. It's more difficult than taking a blood sample. Um, also, we think that the viral load matters. With viral loads, I mean the number of viruses that are available, so the concentration of viruses. Um, and we think that this concentration is higher in people who have symptoms. Um, and also in people who are moderately or severely ill. So uh, once again, it seems more difficult to diagnose uh, people who do not have symptoms or only have mild symptoms. Um, it's also important to always keep in mind that uh, RT-PCR um, only detects genetic material. Um, so you know that the virus has been there recently, uh, but you do not know if the virus is alive. Uh, so you might just be detecting that virus, uh, which is important to know, particularly when uh, towards the end of disease, people might actually be uh, recuperating. Uh, the virus has already died, but the body has not yet uh, disposed of it. Um, so this is always important to keep in mind when you use uh, uh, molecular tests that detect genetic material. Um, PCR tests in general um, are quite sensitive to contamination in the laboratory um, and also to inhibition. So that might be um, a disadvantage, but the central laboratories are well equipped to deal with this. And unfortunately, the first generation of RT-PCRs for COVID-19 
um, are not, uh, we suspect that they are not very sensitive, which means that they have a high false negativity rate. And we think that this is due to the fact that it is difficult to collect a specimen. So we think the test itself probably is okay. When the virus is there in your specimen, the test will detect it, but it's very difficult to collect a good specimen. Um, so when you uh, have a patient and you suspect COVID-19, but the test is negative, the World Health Organization recommends that you repeat the test. So you take a new specimen and you test again, um, and you might even consider taking uh, different sample types um, and to see if you have better luck with a different uh, sample. So for example, you know, try a, a nasopharyngeal swab, but also try saliva. Then assays detecting antibodies. Um, um, studies thus far have shown that uh, uh, IgM and IgG antibodies um, directed to the SARS coronavirus 2 uh, virus can be detected in blood two to four weeks after infection. Um, but it's always important to keep in mind um, that not all antibodies actually neutralize the virus. And we have, at this point in time, we have absolutely no idea whether these antibodies, when they are present, when they are, if they are actually able to neutralize uh, the virus. There's a lot of research ongoing at the moment to try to figure this out. Particularly the RIVM is doing a lot of research on this. Um, then uh, another possibility would be to look for mucosal antibodies, for example, in the nose, uh, like IgA antibodies, because we believe that these might be um, um, important as a first line of defense um, against the virus. Um, but these, uh, the mucosal antibody tests, uh, they are subject of research, but they are not yet available for diagnostic testing. Um, and because it takes um, a while uh, um, for a patient to develop antibodies, uh, WHO recommends uh, that testing is done no sooner than two weeks after the last day of symptoms because otherwise you might test the person, they might not yet have antibodies, and then uh, you falsely believe that they don't have antibodies. Um, but you, know, you may have simply tested too early. Janneke, there is one question. Roos? Okay. I can't hear yes. it, you're muted. Yeah, sorry, yeah. I was muted. Um, Janneke, you showed us the machines that you used to do the test. But I'm really, really interesting in how does the result look like? Is it a Western blot or is what is the information when you do the PCR you get out of the machine? Um, yeah, it's. It, I, I guess that's a bit uh, difficult uh, to answer. What you get out of the machine, what what it basically does, the thermocycler, um, it amplifies uh, the genetic material that it that the primer detects. Um, and what the machine will show how many rounds of amplification are necessary um, for a signal uh, to appear. And if uh, typically you will let the machine cycle, um, you know, many times. Um, and for example, if it's more than 40 times and you still don't have a signal, then you say, okay, there is nothing in there. The sample is negative. Um, and then when there is a signal, um, then the machine will tell you that there is a signal and it will also tell you after how many cycles, how many amplification cycles, uh, the signal became positive. And that will tell you sometimes, depending on the, the pathogen, it may tell you how, how much is there, what the viral load is. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so the different types of antibody tests um, that are, the, so antibodies, a conventional antibody test uh, is an ELISA, and, the, and an ELISA is, works very differently from what I just described for uh, PCR. Um, the ELISA, basically the, the basic principle of this is that uh, um, an antigen and an antibody, so an antigen is a viral protein, and the antibody that the, the human body makes um, to fight the, the virus, um, the antigen and the antibody um, bind very tightly. So you can exploit that in, in an assay. Uh, so you can, um, for example, in, in a 96 plate, uh, well plate, uh, 
uh, you can coat it with antigen, then you add blood sample to it, um, and then the, if there is antibody in the blood sample, it will bind to the antigen in your plate, and you can detect this. There are chemical ways of detecting it. So that's the, the general principle of an ELISA. Um, and uh, ELISAs have been around since the 1970s. So they've been around for 50 years. Um, and uh, so they, you can imagine that many companies uh, uh, make ELISA tests. Um, they all, just about every laboratory worldwide knows how to do an ELISA test. Um, it's a very well-known technology. Um, you do require some instruments um, to be able to measure the signal. Um, and, but these can be very simple. Uh, but most of the laboratories in the Netherlands, the central laboratories, will have fully automated machines, and those are quite uh, complex. Um, so in that case, uh, you know, the, the, the lab technician, basically everything is, almost everything is done by the machine, and the lab technician does not have to do a lot of manual work. Um, and again, as I mentioned earlier, for the PCR test, um, when these fully automated machines are used, uh, typically you, you test many different samples in one test run, which can be an example, uh, which can be an advantage or a disadvantage. So for these antibody tests, um, there actually are also a lot of point of care tests available. Um, and these uh, are based on the exact same principle as an ELISA, um, but um, this has all been miniaturized uh, into what we call lateral flow tests. And I've shown one on this slide. They basically look like a pregnancy test. Um, uh, several of these types of tests have now been developed for COVID-19. For example, the Abbott Base Point test, which is the one that is shown on this slide in the picture, um, or the CTK Biotech on-site test. But there are many, many, many others. Um, and these are um, incredibly user-friendly. Because basically, um, you do the test, you should have where it says C, there should be a control line. Um, that should always be there. If there is no uh, control line, then the test failed. Um, and if the test is positive, you will see two lines. You will see a control line, and you will also see a test line. Um, so this is really easy to do. People could do it themselves. Um, however, the tests that are currently available for COVID-19 um, the, are not very accurate yet. Um, and um, it, it's even though, you know, the, the fact that these tests are very user-friendly actually also means that it takes a while to develop them. So typically a company um, will work on these tests for several years before they have been optimized. And since this COVID-19 is a new virus, companies have not yet had the time to optimize these tests. So the tests that are currently um, available on the market are not yet optimal. So what are some of the challenges with antibody uh, detection? Um, well, of course, first of all, uh, when an antibody test is positive, it could mean that someone um, has an active infection, um, but it could also mean that they had an infection in the past and they are now cured. So antibody tests cannot differentiate between a past infection and an active infection. Um, so if you want to know if someone has an active infection, you would also have to test for the virus itself. Um, as I mentioned, uh, seroconversion, so this is the development of antibodies, takes time, two to four weeks. Um, and we think uh, there are some indications from, uh, for example, Chinese studies, that not everyone seroconverts. So not everyone develops symptoms, even if they've had the virus. And this is probably particularly the case when people only have mild symptoms. Um, so if someone uh, tests negative on an antibody test, there is still a possibility that they have been infected. Um, another problem with uh, um, antibody tests is that we do not know what we call the correlates of protection. I've already mentioned that not even when you have antibodies, it doesn't necessarily mean that those antibodies are also capable of neutralizing the virus. Um, and at this point in time, we do not yet know which antibody types at what levels uh, a person would need to be protected from becoming infected with the virus, from transmitting the virus to someone else, 
or when infected to develop illness. We do not know. Antibody levels probably play a role in all of these processes. Um, and the whole point of vaccine development, for example, is that you would uh, want to protect, at a minimum, you want to protect people from severe illness, but ideally you would also want to protect them from becoming infected in the first place. Um, um, but we first need to know what types of antibodies we need um, before we uh, can develop good diagnostic tests for immunity. Uh, we also do not know how long antibodies last. Uh, we know there are four other coronaviruses uh, circulating in the Netherlands. Uh, these, these cause common colds. Um, and we know that um, our immunity to those viruses wane over a few years. Um, so they, we don't have the antibodies for the rest of our lives. So maybe two years down the line, down the line you can be infected with the, with the exact same virus. You're no longer protected. So we think that this is probably also the case with this coronavirus, but we do not, not yet know. And in contrast to um, detecting the virus itself with its unique genetic code, uh, when you're detecting antibodies, there can be uh, cross-reactivity uh, because the viruses do uh, have some of the same proteins. Um, so antibodies uh, uh, directed towards one virus might also react with a, 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 a similar virus. Um, so some of these um, antibody tests for COVID-19 might be false positive. They might actually react to uh, one of the coronaviruses that causes um, a common cold. So I think, I hope I've convinced you that um, some of the tests that we have are not yet um, ideal and that there are still many things that we have to sort out. Um, and for this, we need to do diagnostic accuracy, accuracy studies. Um, and, um, and this is actually really, really challenging um, because basically we do not have a gold standard. Uh, usually when we do diagnostic accuracy, accuracy studies, uh, we would test, uh, we would compare the new test to a gold standard test. Um, and in the case of COVID-19, we do not have a gold st uh, standard test. Uh, what you could do um, is use a composite endpoint. So I told you earlier that um, uh, physicians will use a variety of um, uh, factors to make a diagnosis, including symptoms and um, um, physical exams. Um, uh, CT scans, whether someone has been exposed to, to someone else with COVID-19, etc. Um, so you could um, uh, combine all of those factors to create a gold standard, uh, but at the moment uh, we do not yet have a good case definition. We do not know exactly, um, you know, what that COVID-19 diagnosis should look like. So it's very difficult to do these diagnostic accuracy studies. And I think um, particularly the validation of negative results is problematic. I think when you have a positive result, at least we can be reasonably sure when, it's, when you do a test with the PCR and you detect the virus with the PCR test, we can be very sure that that person has uh, COVID-19. So the positive tests, we can use the RT-PCR as the gold standard, but the negative tests results are very difficult to validate uh, because we know that the PCRs are often false negative. We know that not everyone seroconverts and it takes time to seroconvert. So I think it's particularly problematic to validate the negative results. So that's all I wanted to say about diagnostic tests. Um, and the last part of my presentation is, is how we might use testing in containing the epidemic. But before I move on, does anyone have any question about the tests themselves? No? Okay, so um, role of testing in containing the epidemic. So first of all, um, how was, has testing been used thus far in the Netherlands? Um, well, I think most of you have heard in the news that um, initially test capacity was quite limited. Um, and when they talk about test capacity, they mostly mean the capacity to do the PCR testing for, uh, to detect the virus itself. Um, in the beginning of the epidemic, um, 
the RT-PCR testing was used as part of contact tracing by the GGD. So when um, a, a case, someone was identified, for example, someone was admitted in hospital um, and uh, found out that they, were, that they had COVID-19, then the GGD would visit uh, that person's um, uh, relatives, their housemates, people that they were in close contact with, um, and they would test all of those people uh, with a PCR test. And then when people test positive, they would have to self-isolate. And this was used in the beginning of the epidemic to contain the spread of the virus. Um, at some point though, the, the virus spread so rapidly um, that it was no longer possible to do this. And I will get back to that issue in the next slide. Um, then so far, we've also used uh, PCR testing of, of most hospitalized patients. They will mostly, most of them will receive a test. And we've also used it for hospital employees um, because, of course, we would like to protect, uh, uh, we, we, we want to prevent the virus from spreading within the hospital. There are many vulnerable patients in the hospital. We also want to protect the employees themselves. So um, we've been, um, all employees who have symptoms, even if they are only, uh, only have mild symptoms, are tested. And then increasingly, as, as you have uh, heard on the news, um, healthcare workers and carers outside the hospital environment are also uh, being tested. Um, the RIVM now also recommends testing of vulnerable people via their primary care physicians um, or other physicians, um, but only if this testing has added value for their care. Um, and um, at the moment, the RIVM and Sanquin are also doing some uh, large uh, nationwide studies in which they test people for antibodies. And the main purpose of this is just to see, um, to have an estimate of how many people in the Netherlands might have already had the infection. As I mentioned earlier, the antibody tests are not very good yet. So they, um, they do not give these uh, results to individual people, but they just use it to have an estimate um, at population level. You've also heard in the news, many people say that um, South Korea has been so um, successful in containing its epidemic um, because they have done so much testing. And there is a very nice uh, case study about this on the, uh, the Harvard uh, website. Um, in, in South Korea, they had more than 600 testing centers. They used all kinds of innovative uh, ways of testing people using uh, drive uh, through, uh, negative pressure, telephone booths, like the one that is shown in this image. Um, then all of the test results uh, um, were um, assembled in a central database, um, so people could easily track the positive results. Uh, government paid for all of the testing, so there were no barriers to testing. Anyone who wanted to get tested could be tested. Um, another thing that South Korea did that's quite unique, I think, is that they tested all of the contacts, even if they did not have any symptoms. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, this really may have been very important because um, some people um, um, who carry the virus may, may be asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic. However, um, I think they were also so successful because they had very, uh, thorough contact tracing methods. You know, they used uh, GPS signals, uh, CCTV cameras, financial transactions, et cetera. And they also enforced isolation with fines. And these types of measures are not acceptable in the Netherlands or in Europe or in North America. So this was possible in South Korea, but it's not something that we could do uh, in the Netherlands. So what could we do in the Netherlands? Uh, what kind of role do we envision for diagnostics in containing um, the epidemic in the Netherlands in the future? And for this final part of my presentation, um, I would like to make some assumptions because otherwise it becomes very complex. So for now, I will assume that the, the next generation PCRs, which are coming onto the market now, have good sensitivity and specificity in identifying infectious cases. So they have been improved already on the ones that we currently have available. And I think we should be able to have really good PCR tests that will detect 
um, uh, infected uh, people. Um, and let's also assume for now, and this is a much bigger if, um, that immunity can be achieved so that you know, um, people make neutralizing antibodies, that we figure out how to test for immunity and that immunity lasts for at least a year. These are big assumptions. We do not, not yet know this. There is a lot of research going on in this area. Um, and hopefully we'll, we will make some progress in the next few weeks, two months. Um, but for now, I'm going to assume that this will be possible. Um, and of course, you know, this doesn't mean that we have to wait for the perfect tests. Uh, what I would suggest is that we start implementing the measures that I've listed on the next few slides with the assays that are currently available. Um, but in the beginning, uh, we would have to be a bit more conservative. So if we um, suspect that someone has COVID-19, the test is negative, but we have other indications that it still is very likely that the person does have COVID-19, um, then we should isolate. Uh, they should self-isolate. So we should, in the beginning, be very conservative. And then as better tests become available, we can gradually improve um, on, our, on our measures and we can be uh, more specific in our, um, what we ask people to do. So I envision um, three main categories of how we might use diagnostics in containing the epidemic. One is, of course, to incorporate diagnostics into the lockdown exit strategies um, that hopefully will start in May. Um, and uh, that's the topic of the next few slides. Um, we can also use diagnostics um, to monitor these lockdown exit policy policies in real time. So for example, um, starting soon, the schools, uh, the 11th of May, the schools will re reopen. Um, and from the moment the schools reopen, we should track uh, transmissions to see if transmissions increase after the schools have opened. Um, and if we see too much of an increase, then we can adjust the policy. Um, so, and I think uh, diagnostics play a very important role in this. Um, and I will not discuss this uh, further um, in the presentation. So, but just keep in the back of your mind that um, um, you know, this, the, this constant monitoring of what's going to happen when we exit lockdown uh, is definitely part of a, a, a large uh, part of um, the, the role of diagnostics. And then, of course, we also need diagnostics to evaluate uh, uh, COVID-19 treatments, vaccines, and other prevention interventions at the individual level, like in clinical trials. Um, but I will not discuss this further. So incorporate into lockdown exit strategies. What might that look like? Well, first of all, I think almost all exit strategies that I have seen uh, call for continued protection of the vulnerable. You know, we are all aware that when we um, exit lockdown, um, that um, the number of uh, new cases will increase. Um, and this might not be the end of the world, but we do want to protect our vulnerable people. So as, as if we can shield the vulnerable people, then um, I think we can take more risks. Um, so uh, what we should do um, and what likely will happen is low threshold testing of the vulnerable, especially those that are institutionalized, for example, in nursing homes and their carers. At the moment, uh, the RIVM only uh, recommends this um, when it actually helps in um, uh, providing care to the vulnerable. Um, but I think, you know, as test capacity increases, uh, we will become, um, we will do even more testing. So I think there will be a lot of testing of vulnerable people um, and their carers. And to make that possible, I think it's important that we bring the testing to the institutions instead of the other way around. Um, and for example, this can be achieved uh, using mobile vans. You know, we can have mobile laboratories. We can use some of these point of care tests that I mentioned earlier, particularly the point of care uh, PCR tests. And we can, we can uh, use those in, in, uh, in a mobile laboratory uh, that we can uh, bring to the institutions. Um, 
And in addition, most exit strategies call for uh, continued protection of people in uh, vital professions. Um, and this can be expanded. At the moment, it's mostly people working in healthcare. Um, but this can be expanded, for example, to teachers, to police officers, to bus drivers, etc. So people who um, um, are in, um, but because of the nature of their jobs, have to be in contact with many other people, and we need them to keep to run our society. Um, so I think there will also be low threshold testing um, of uh, people in those types of uh, professions. Um, and then the most difficult part um, is basically the test and trace. I already discussed how in the beginning of the epidemic, uh, the GGD used this strategy to try uh, to contain the epidemic when we still thought that we might be able to prevent the epidemic from happening in the first place. Um, we now are at a point in the Dutch epidemic that transmission has reached very low levels. Um, so we can now um, um, exit some of our lockdown strategies, but it's very important that we reinstall this test and trace strategy um, to contain flare-ups because we know there will be flare-ups for sure. Um, and so we need to reinstall test and trace. However, uh, what we have noticed in the beginning of the epidemic is that the way the GGD does this, using people basically, so they will identify a case the person will give them some phone numbers. People at the GGD will phone these contacts. They will make an appointment for testing. All of that takes too much time. So we need to do this much more quickly. And this is where the mobile apps, the mobile phone apps uh, come in that you've heard about on the news. So you, we might be able to use mobile phone apps. We might be able to use wearable vital signs monitors. So these are, for example, bracelets that can measure temperature. There are even patches that can um, measure oxygen saturation. Um, and we can also use big data me methods that can, for example, show how many people contact their GP or how many people have been hospitalized or um, um, attend a uh, emergency room. And all of that information, um, if we stay on top of it, uh, could be employed to identify potential transmission clusters much more quickly than the GGD has been able to do in the beginning of the epidemic. Now, all of this sounds very nice, but is, of course, very complex. So a lot of people are working on this. And um, I think for sure we will try some of these things out in the next few months. So you will hear a lot more about this in the news. But at this point in time, it really is unknown whether this will actually work because we've never had to deal with a situation like this before in the Netherlands. Um, so all of this is very new. Um, hopefully it will help with the test and trace. Um, and if it doesn't, at least we will learn some very valuable lessons for the next epidemic. And then of course, when we, when we identify people um, who have been, for example, um, through the mobile phone apps, who have been exposed to a COVID-19 case, then of course it would be great if we don't have to tell the, this person, oh, you've been close to someone with COVID-19, now you have to stay at home for, 12, uh, for two weeks, um, it would be better if we could test that person um, and to see if they actually have uh, the infection. Um, and in the future, when we also have good immunity tests, to also test that person for immunity. So people who are already immune, we can then tell them, okay, you don't have to self-isolate, you're immune. Um, and in fact, they would then be immune for the next two years or so, and they no longer need to be tested. And they can just, they can, whenever uh, they come in into contact with someone with COVID-19, they can simply say, I am, I am immune. Um, and the, the people who are, um, uh, who test uh, infection negative would also not have to self-isolate. So only the people who are um, infection positive and not yet immune would have to self-isolate. And I think if you can give individuals such um, individual advice that is based on test results, I think this will be much more acceptable to people. So they are more likely to adhere to the advice. Um, and I also think that it will cause less economic damage because there will be um, a smaller number of people that actually has to self-isolate. Now we have to be very conservative. Anyone who um, may have infection has to self-isolate, but when you test, 
you can really only, um, you, you can, um, everyone who tests negative does not have to self-isolate. So fewer people will have to self-isolate and this will cause less economic damage. And then in the longer term, you, you've also heard this on television, this I think is something that Germany has been contemplating is you could, you know, anyone who has um, tested um, immune, um, you could give them a piece of paper that states that they are immune, like an immunity passport. But as I mentioned uh, earlier, um, this, this really is um, a longer term future. At the moment, we, we do not have a test that can show that someone is immune. Um, and then um, I think this is my last slide. Um, some disadvantages or, and advantages, uh, additional advantages and disadvantages of testing. Um, some advantages, um, I think I've noticed um, that a lot of people really want to know their test results. This reduces stress. And I think the cases that I have seen is especially because people uh, worry about their own health. For example, people who are vulnerable and they have heart disease and they are really worried about catching the virus. Um, so a negative test results, um, uh, of course, gives them peace of mind. And the same applies to people who have vulnerable loved ones like elderly parents or grandparents. So I think um, testing can really reduce stress. Um, and as I mentioned, I think uh, testing also facilitates better adherence um, to physical distancing and isolation measures. And I think that's really important because we're in this for the long term. I think we won't have a, have a vaccine until the end of the year at the very earliest. Um, so we probably will have to have some degree of physical distancing and, and self-isolation at least until the end of the year. Um, so I think um, adherence with that is, is very important. And when you test people and they test positive, they understand why they have to do it. and They are much more likely um, to be adherent. However, there are also so, some disadvantages. Uh, testing costs money. Um, but I think some of this money may, may be recouped because of what I just explained, that uh, there likely will be less economic harm, but this still needs to be investigated. And there might also be uh, less um, other medical collateral damage. Um, you know, uh, people with cancer not, not getting their treatments on time, etc. cetera. Um, so I think in the end, when you take all of these things uh, together, um, testing might not cost as much money as we think it does. Um, and of course, the biggest disadvantage uh, with imperfect tests is that it can give people a full sense of security. Um, you know, if you um, 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 test negative, particularly if you have a, a false negative PCR test, um, you know, you, you are infected, but the test is negative and you think you are negative, and then you can go on to infect other people. So imperfect tests um, can be quite dangerous, which is why it's important that we validate them properly. And I think that was my last slide. So if there are any questions, I am happy to answer them.